<laughs> you. Yes, indeed. Hi, my name is Terry. Hey, Terry. I don't understand how or why, but I have lived a lie. I've actually been a lie for the past 50 years. Tonight, for the first time in 50 years, I'm telling the truth. I'm being the truth about my life. Terry, is it possible that you are actually 80 years old? What do you mean by that, Doc? You know I'm only 47, born in 1953. Have you been drinking heavily for the past 60 years? Doc, what's going on? You know I don't drink. Well, Terry, if neither of these scenarios is true, then we have a very serious problem. And so it was that in 1999, with a body ravaged by disease and a brain deteriorated beyond functional use, I resigned as pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Wilsonville, Oregon, and moved the family 70 miles south to Sweet Home so that my wife could be close to her parents when I died. The prognosis was grim. I had at best six months to live. I had felt at five years of age that God was calling me into the ministry, a dream that soon became the essence of my every ambition and the seemingly obvious sole outcome of my intense love for the Lord. Seventeen years of age found me barefoot in a barn preaching on Psalm 23 to a group of migrant workers using an upturned bale of hay as an improvised pulpit. My subsequent pastoral journey began as a senior in high school and took me from the First Baptist Church in Prospect, Oregon, near Crater Lake, and on to churches in Alaska, Idaho, back to Oregon, and then ultimately to Wind River Baptist Church in Pinedale, Wyoming. Church planting, pastoring, music ministry, rescue missions, Christian schools, youth work, Christian camping, Christian retreats, mission trips out of country, street outreach, men's ministries. This was the stuff of my life. The wife of my youth and our four children and I had poured the very essence of our family life into Christian service for 30 years. And then in 1999, in Wilsonville, Oregon, at age 47, I found myself with six months to live. I had always been a preacher's kid. Perhaps that fact in itself played a part in my sensing a call into the ministry. Perhaps my desire to be like the dad that I never really connected with played a part in that same call. But as a preacher's kid, I seem to have somehow missed the baton of manhood that may or may not have been handed off to me by my father. I knew that I was a boy, and I wanted to grow up to be a man. But it seems to me in retrospect that there was no man's hand put into that empty glove of male DNA bestowed upon me by my creator in my mother's womb. I cannot remember my father's arms ever being around me. I cannot recall my father ever saying that he loved me. I know my father was then and is today a good man. But there are certain things about him that for the life of me, I cannot recall. By age 10, I still did not know that boys could not get pregnant. Even though I was fairly certain that I was not supposed to know what the word pregnant meant, I did know. And that is why I pleaded with Rodney that day. 
he was the deacon's high school kid, my little friend Johnny's big brother, not to do that thing he wanted to do to me. The ultimate goal of all his physical attention to me during the past few months. One of the most riveting thoughts I remember having as a boy was the one I had a year earlier as I boarded the school bus the morning after being with Rodney in the shower for the first time and seeing and touching things that simply astounded me. I looked around at the kids on the school bus and said to myself, now I am different than everyone else. And I have felt different ever since. And that is the day that my lying, my lie, began. I see clearly now the direct connection between my psychiatrist's diagnosis of severe bipolar disorder today and my feelings that morning on the school bus. Now I am different than everyone else. I have felt different. I have been different ever since. And that is the day the lying, my lie, began. Years later, in reflection of my youth, I wrote, they thought I could do anything. They called me Boy Wonder. Little did anyone know that I was Boy Blunder. No one saw the lightning strike, no one heard the thunder, and no one knew the dichotomy that my soul now labored under. It was then that I began to live within the paradigm of a double-minded soul. I pursued the Lord Jesus Christ with white-hot fervor on one hand, while on the other hand I masked my pain and confusion by developing a distinguished accent as a passive-aggressive rebellion against my dad, by pushing myself to the point of exhaustion in becoming a virtuoso pianist, by, ironically enough, mastering Spanish as a second language, by making a platform for my charade through public speaking and by dating and giving gifts to and falling in love with girls, all the while trying to find my own identity in my obsessive compulsive relationships with other males. Again, in retrospect, I recently wrote, two roads diverged in my youthful wood. I took them both. And that is what made me different. I did not set out to be a liar, to live a lie. I did not intend to deceive. I did not desire to become bipolar and manic depressive. I did not plan to be overcome, mastered, and fiercely driven by deviant sexual desire. Yet fear was my motive. I thought I had everything to lose if I came clean. Deceit was my method. I thought I had everything to gain if I pretended it all away. And a family and a religious system that refused to recognize or even acknowledge my dilemma were my opportunity, my doorway into a private lifetime of wrestling between darkness and light. Psalm 12.3 was my problem. With a double heart, they speak. Psalm 86.11 was my prayer. Unite my heart to fear thy name. The first masculine touch I remember, the first masculine interest in me that I recall, the first masculine explanation and explicit demonstration of sex to me was from Rodney, the child molester. Since the big monstrous unspoken secret in my family was that my dad and my mother and my sister and I actually had sex organs, 
I became intrigued by and felt uniquely privileged and actually quite superior because of Rodney and his cousin Kevin's sexual interest in me and experimentation on me. Don't think that I didn't try to get help down through the years. I would scream to my dad for help. But he could never hear the screams inside my head. I wrote to a Christian radio psychologist who wrote back and said, I needed to see a psychiatrist. I confided in an evangelist. He wrote to my denomination telling them never to hire me as a pastor. I confided in my youth sponsor. She warned my girlfriend never to marry me. I confided in a charismatic pastor who nearly broke my neck trying to get me baptized in the spirit and speaking in tongues. I went to an exorcist to get rid of the demons. I promised and I committed and I recommitted and I tried and I tried and I tried to get better and I failed. I cried and 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 I cried for 50 years. My natural and innate need and desire for a masculine template upon which to build my life had been handed to me not by my father, but by my friend's older brother Rodney and his cousin Kevin, the child molesters. Thus I developed an unhealthy and unnatural same-sex attraction rather than a healthy and natural same-sex identification. I lost myself in the process. Feverishly pursuing a Christ-like identity in the open and desperately pursuing a masculine identity in secret. It was like careening down a steep ski slope with each ski on a different trail. It was the best of me. It was the worst of me. Such damnable dichotomy. There was no I in me. And that is how and why Dawn stole my heart so easily. During the aforementioned summer between my junior and senior year in high school as a missionary to migrants along with a group of Baptist college students Don the college senior from California Baptist College in Riverside California sought me out paid attention to me loved me seduced me and stole my heart and my mind and my emotions and my will and my body I was no longer a 10-year-old boy being forced into sexual activity long before actual sexual desire had emerged. I was a 17-year-old, fully developed young man with adult emotions on the cusp of his years of sexual virility, yet still in search of his own masculinity. The fall I got back from the migrant camp, my father, not knowing what had happened to me, preached on how homosexuals should be tarred and feathered and ridden out of town on a rail. Dad, I screamed, don't you know what your own son is going through? But I was once again only screaming inside my head. And this time from a church pew. Anyway, my screaming would have been drowned out by the deacon's amens. I had an epiphany at my wedding altar. Dads, this is true, dads must tell their sons about sex after the ceremony. But of course that never happened. Later, 
I worried about how to tell him and mom that I had four children. I seriously considered I would tell them I got them out of a catalog just to save face. Seriously. And thus my desire for a masculine identity of my own was lured and enticed into same-sex attraction, which gave birth to same-sex addiction, which then in turn led to the inevitable AIDS death sentence. It was back on October 2nd, 1985 in Fairbanks, Alaska, the day the news broke that Rock Hudson had died of a mysterious new disease known as Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS, that I knew in the depths of my heart that I had the same disease. It was not, however, until I was near death in 1999 that my disease was actually diagnosed end-stage AIDS, from which there was no recovery, and AIDS-related dementia of the brain from which there is no return. My thinking was so delusional at the time that I have no real recollection of my reaction to the diagnosis. Obviously, my family was humiliated. My wife and two daughters had to be tested for the HIV virus. Obviously, my church was dumbfounded, devastated, and hurt. Obviously, the Christian community at large cringed once again in painful chagrin. Yet by God's goodness and grace, I did not die. The AIDS virus disappeared from my body and my brain was restored to its size and shape and vitality. My passion for God was at an all-time high, yet I'm certain I was still delusional. I went on to earn a bachelor's degree in writing and history. I continued on to earn a master's degree in pastoral theology. I was rising at 3 a.m. every morning to pray. Even as late as January of this year, I was making plans to earn a doctorate in theology so as to make one more attempt at making things right in my life. But my search for my own identity did not stop. My confusion did not stop. My pain did not stop. My pretense did not stop. My lies did not stop. My deceit did not stop. My craving for pornography did not stop. My sexual sin did not stop. My codependency did not stop. My manic depressive behavior cycles did not stop. My ludicrous spending did not stop. The consequences did not stop. My wife is now married to someone else. My children and grandchildren manage without me. I have very little memory of the past 50 years. I have no money that testifies to any kind of stewardship throughout the years. I have no friends that vouch for any integrity along the way. I am not fighting every man's battle. I am fighting the other man's battle. I am the loneliest man who ever lived. I have no me. My dad bless his soul, did not pursue me. Rodney pursued me. Dawn pursued me. And I pursued sin. 
and I lost. I know God pursued me before I was born. I know God saved me as a small boy. I know that God has never left me. I know that God has a plan for my life. I know that God wins. In the past year, my higher power, my God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived his life for me and died for me and rose for me and saved me and has a home in heaven for me and is coming back for me, orchestrated my move to Wyoming away from my old haunts and memories of sin and continued the work he began in me when I was just a boy. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus, my God, has a plan for my life. My life did not turn out the way I thought it would. But as Job said of old, He knows the path that I take. And when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. In June of this year, Matthew and Emmy Daniels, Matthew, my pastor, Alex and Lindsay Sane, Alex is Matthew's co-pastor, Maureen Hutchinson and myself started to celebrate church in Pinedale, Wyoming, with the intention of beginning a celebrate recovery ministry as well. Matthew and his lifelong yearning to be in the ministry, Alex in his intense calling to preach the gospel, Maureen in her spirit of godly boldness, and me in my, well, whatever. To paraphrase a well-known poem, always a mask held in the slim hand whitely, always he had a mask before his face, smiling and sprightly. Truly the wrist holding it lightly fitted the task. Sometimes, however, was there a shipper, fingertip quiver, ever so slightly holding the mask? For years and years and years I wondered but dared not ask and then I blundered, looked behind the mask to find nothing. He had no face. He had become merely a hand holding a mask with grace. Matthew and Daniel, my pastors, dared to look behind the mask. They saw all of me through a biblically objective lens, a lens I had never been able to use myself. They asked me to disassociate myself from any aspect of pastoral ministry. They confronted me with the truth that I was not qualified to be a pastor. They explained to me that I had never been qualified to be a pastor. They pondered with me the fact that I may never be qualified to be a pastor. They also realized that the way they dealt with me would define their own ministries for the rest of their lives. So in accordance with 1 Timothy 5.1, they did not rebuke the older man, but encouraged him as they would their own fathers. They realized that in accordance with James 5.15, if they were to bring me back from my wandering from the truth, they would save my soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. They realized that in accordance with Jude one twenty three. That even though they were very afraid, they could show mercy on me while hating the flesh-stained garments and snatch me out of the fire. 
So, they told me they loved me. They, Matthew and Alex, put their arms around me and held me. They said we would get through this together. They asked me to commit to celebrate recovery accountability. And they said to me, you are not an other. You are our brother. Today, thanks to Matthew and Alex's friendship and ministry to me as my pastors and Matthew's ministry to me as my Celebrate Recovery accountability partner and Maureen's ministry to me in support and prayer, my same-sex addiction has been dealt a death blow. My same-sex attraction is being tenderly and scripturally addressed. My true identity in Christ is emerging, and my hurts, habits, and hang-ups are in good hands. I needed to stay in Wyoming, <coughs> away from my old hangouts in Oregon. I needed to give up my computer and any computer access. I needed to give up email and social network access. I needed a new phone without internet access. I needed to begin telling the truth about myself wherever and whenever appropriate. My pastor, my accountability partner, my friend, Matthew Daniels, has been my only hold on reality these last few months. He listens to me. He reads my Celebrate Recovery workbook responses faithfully. He bears my burdens. He has never said, sure, I'll help you. I'm not like that, but... He has never walked away from me. Never. He lends me his dignity by allowing me, me, to be his accountability partner and read his Celebrate Recovery workbook responses. He knows me, and yet he loves me. He and his wife, Emmy, have me often in their home. I made a promise to my pastor, Matthew, as my accountability partner, I will never lie to you. Pastor Matthew knew we were starting over and was willing to take me at my word. That promise changed my life. That promise stopped my promiscuity dead in its tracks. That promise nipped my pursuit of pornography in the bud. The promise made the conduit of transformation for my soul. That promise opened the door for me to confess sins that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt were on the immediate horizon, thereby disarming their power and assuring me victory. That promise opened the door for my pastor to ask me anything at any time and expect the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. About making that promise, I wrote these words. With timidity, I dare to step onto the welcome mat laid out for me upon the threshold of your soul. About the power of my holy and deadly fear of breaking that promise and spoiling my first pristine friendship in 50 years, I wrote these words, one lie, a thousand truths will out, as dead men's bones do whitewashed tombs. I'm more afraid of lying to my friend than I have been afraid of anything in my life. For reasons known only to God, one man's courage to uphold a broken brother 
and one broken man's courage to make the first real promise of his life, and one man's courage to listen, and one man's courage to talk, the Good Shepherd has left the 99 sheep in the fold and has found the wanderer and is bringing him home. I am still confused about the last 50 years. I still hurt. I am still lonely. I am still afraid. But I am still saved. I am still moving forward. And I still have hope. I am still in need of the Celebrate Recovery Ministry. I don't understand how or why, but I have lied for the past 50 years. Tonight, I speak the truth. Terry and I have been meeting almost daily for three months now. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. And Terry has shown me that we are called as a church to do this daily, even hourly, to lay down your life a minute at a time by listening, loving others, praying with them for their healing. In pursuing righteousness and purity together for the glory of God, for the worth of His Son. And it's been a privilege to see the power of the gospel. And to have this opportunity to serve our God and Savior and His Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for letting us share.